welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We have allowed ourselves to become so disconnected and ignorant about something that is as intimate as the food that we eat. Be prepared to grow your own for victory. God said I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink foam pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadowlark. So God made a farmer. Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm your host, Harold Thornbro, and really glad you're with me again this week. And, uh, you know, I had a I had this episode all planned out for like a week about uh, raising Caternix quail. And I've had the show notes ready. I'll have to sit down and record it. But I have been just super, super sick for like a week, coughing really bad, really stuffed up head. And, um, and as you can hear in my voice today, I'm still not over it. So what I did today was I reached out to some folks in the, the homestead front porch. And I said, hey, if a few of you want to send in some recordings of why you got into homesteading, I would just uh, love to play some of those for some inspiration. Maybe uh, let it be a reminder to folks who are, who are homesteading of why they got into homesteading, just to think about that again and maybe kind of re-energize. And, and for those folks who are thinking about starting the homestead, it's always great to hear the stories of why they, why other people are doing it. So it's just a, it's just an, an encouraging thing to hear. So a few people sent in some, some, um, audio clips of why they got started. And, uh, I actually went back into, uh, the, uh, the episode archives there and I pulled out a couple I thought were really good from some past episodes with some guests we've had. And then I'm going to close today by, uh, playing a clip of me on another podcast. I was on a, I was on a pad podcast, uh, hosted by Jason Carrier, um, called live free and grow. And, uh, he asked me why I got into homesteading. So I'll play a little bit of that, of uh, what, what got me into it and what I started doing right off the bat. So we'll close with that. And then I'll probably pop in here a couple times and at the end. So I uh, hope you enjoy this episode. We'll kick it right off with uh, Troy McClung from Red Tool House. You've heard Troy on this uh, show a couple times, and uh, he chimed in with the uh, with a clip of why he got into uh, homesteading. Hello, everybody. This is Troy with Red Tool House Homestead. We're a homestead located in the southern part of West Virginia. We started homesteading about seven years ago for three main reasons. The first reason was we wanted to know where our food comes from and be responsible for more uh, for producing more of our own food. As uh, as most of us get into homesteading, uh, our issue is we watched Food Inc. and we're already kind of aware of cer- certain situations. But after watching that, it was really a aha moment for my wife and I, and we decided, hey, we need to we need to be more responsible for producing our own food. We need to know more about where it comes from. So we started as like most people, we started with chickens and went from that direction and just just grew into more uh, of our own food production here on the homestead. The second reason is we wanted to do more with the land that we have. We've uh, we've been blessed to have uh, about 100 acres. We've had that for about 17 years now. And up until about seven years ago, we really weren't doing much with it other than just enjoying the uh, the wooded area of it. It's all mountainous and wooded here in West Virginia. But uh, seven years ago, when we decided to really get into this, we thought, wow, we could really do a lot more with this land. It could produce fruit. It could produce gardens. It could produce livestock. Um, there's all kinds of things that the, this land can do. So we wanted to, to really see what all we could do with this land that we've been blessed with. So that was, that was a natural progression into homesteading there. And the third reason is we wanted to learn uh, skills that many in our generation have lost and even in future generations are losing. And we wanted to teach, uh, learn these skills and be able to teach them to our boys so they could carry them on. And we think that you know, learning some of these skills as far as you know, how, to, how to make things with your own hands, how to repair stuff, how to raise a garden, how to raise animals, um, all of those type of skills that so many people take for granted these days, we wanted to pass those on to our boys and, and, and prove to them and show to all of us how, how beneficial that could be if uncertain times came about, if um, the economy failed or uh, just some natural disaster, those type of things. Those skills could really come in handy. So that's the reason why we jumped into homesteading, and we've enjoyed it ever since. Um, 
it's been a great challenge. I feel like I learn something every week uh, when I'm here on the homestead trying new things. We're excited that Harold's given us a chance to uh, come on the podcast and just say our two cents. We love the podcast, Harold. Keep it up and appreciate it. Hope you get to feeling better. Take care. I appreciate that, Troy. Uh, I enjoyed the, uh, it sounded like you were recording that outside. I enjoyed the ambiance of uh, some cricket sounds in the background. I thought that was kind of cool. I don't know if everybody will pick up on that, but I could definitely hear it in the recording. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, next we're going to hear from Christopher Soulsby. Uh, he's a uh, urban homesteading in Utah and he, uh, he chimed in with a, with a clip of what he's got going on up there and why he got into doing what he's doing. Hey, Harold. Figured uh, with all the work that you always do for us, you're asking for a little help from us, so I might as well chime in here. So what got me into homesteading? Um, I'm still fairly new at it. I am learning uh, all the ropes there is to it as quick as I can, but there is a lot to learn. I was raised in Southern California, right in the heart of Orange County. Uh, as you can imagine, I, I know you've probably been there there's not really a whole lot in terms of nature lots of freeways everywhere uh, new houses being built in any little tiny spot of land they can possibly find and if they can't build the houses out they just build them up and so your view of the sky is also limited just as much uh, my wife and I got sick of it we just were kind of tired of not being able to go out anywhere without being stuck in traffic for hours and hours at a time so we decided to up and leave. Uh, we moved to Utah, and just short and pretty, we absolutely love it here. Uh, it is a beautiful state, and at the time we moved here, we had no plans to do homesteading. It was not even on our radar, didn't really know what it was. I was working for a certain large home improvement store, and I was actually on their overnight team. And... Due to that, I just had headphones in all night, was listening to music for about a year, and just kind of got sick of listening to music, and that's when I discovered podcasts. I had no clue what I wanted to listen to. I just started looking through a playlist of a bunch of stuff and came across one. I'll throw the name out here. They're not podcasting anymore, but it is Chicken Thistle Farm. It was an amazing podcast, and completely new information to me. I had no clue about how to garden, how to homestead, how to do any of that, and I just enjoyed listening to them from the beginning until they eventually stopped podcasting uh, due to they just wanted to be more private and living their lives as they are. But it really turned me on to the whole idea of doing homesteading. Uh, I started listening to pretty much predominantly podcasts until even today. You know, I'd I'm really turned on to your podcast. I really enjoy it. And I listen to quite a few others also. I love the information that I get a pull from it. So one of the things that really turned me on a lot was the whole point of resilience. Just earning resilience, learning it, uh, finding ways to include it in your life if anything does happen. My wife has some medical issues. And it started making me nervous, you know, all these medicines they keep putting her on and nothing seems to be working and then just seeing the culmination of everything we eat and it got me kind of sick when I looked on all of our labels and you can't read half the crap that's on there usually one of the first two three four ingredients is some sort of high fructose corn syrup or the like and I decided, you know, I should probably just start a garden. And I decided, well, I'm going to be starting a garden. I might as well learn seed starting. So I, right off the bat, just started seed starting. Uh, had a very large area of my yard that I decided to sequester off and turn into a garden. Uh, again, I had no clue what I was really doing uh, my first year. I probably botched up a lot of things, uh, overwatered too much, underwatered. I, again, I had no clue what I was doing, but I just figured I would start. Uh, eventually slowly started kicking certain foods out, stopped uh, going to some of these bigger name fast food uh, restaurants after learning all the crap that's in there. 
uh, we decided at one point that we would get chickens. Um, again, a whole new realm for me. I didn't have pets growing up. I didn't have anything growing up. It was just our family. So chickens was a whole new venture for me, but we absolutely fell in love. It was an awesome transformation, I would say, for both of us. Because it really, really got us, as they say, it's like the gateway drug, into that whole mindset of being more self-sufficient. Uh, we would love to, at this point in our lives, get more animals, but being on an urban homestead, it just isn't possible. We don't have the space for it. We don't, we wouldn't have anywhere to feed them unless we're buying feed and we'd like to do things as naturally as possible. But, the whole homesteading thing, it's, it's, it's an awesome, awesome venture that we've been taking, you know. As you mentioned, it doesn't require you to have five, six, seven acres. You can do it on an urban lot, which we definitely are in an urban lot. We've looked into finding land and getting that whole thing together. Sometimes it just doesn't work out, and right now it, we decided is not the time. But who knows, tomorrow an awesome deal might come up and we might end up changing that. But for the time being, we're planning just to stay put. Make our homestead here. Expand our knowledge on anything. We're going to be learning a lot of preserving this year because, again, I'm expanding my garden size. Which means I'm going to have a lot more vegetables and fruit to deal with at the end of the season. And... That's going to be a whole new venture. I don't know how to do preserving, but I can tell you I will be starting very soon now, learning as much as I can. And I think that's one of the greatest things about homesteading is the knowledge, the wealth of knowledge that there is that just kind of seems to be forgotten. You know, whenever I'm at work and sitting there eating my eggs and People always ask me, is that from your chickens? Well, yes, it is from my chickens, and I get to share a little bit of them with them about, you know, why it's awesome to have chickens. Uh, I'll be sitting there eating something from my garden, and I get to tell them about the garden. And, you know, everybody's always interested. They always are so amazed that I'm doing that because I think that knowledge has just slipped from so many people today, which is sad. Uh, you know, I grew up not knowing it. I, it was something that my parents never did. Their parents never did. Uh, I don't know when that whole trend started to shift, but I would love to be able to continue on this path for my whole life and get to the point where when we have kids that our kids are not overwhelmed by it because they just grew up with it, that they can teach their kids and their kids and their kids and you know, just start a new trend, start a new path. And, you know, that that really is one of the things that I'm grateful for you and all these other podcasters is spending their time to share their knowledge with us who might not know everything. But I think that's what homesteading is all about, is it's not just taking care of yourself, but it's taking care of others. And I do have a little website that I'm starting for myself just to start blogging. Uh, it's still early. I still, again, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm hoping that just my little bit of knowledge can help other people. And yeah, I just, again, want to say thank you for all you do. I really appreciate it. Uh, the Homestead Front Porch is an awesome resource on Facebook. Uh, love, love reading all the questions people have on there. The answers that they give are just phenomenal. Uh, again, it's a great community. The homesteading community is just worlds apart from any other corporate type of thing. And I absolutely love it. Again, thank you very much. Thank you for that, Christopher. That was some really good stuff. And I, too, was a huge fan of the Chicken Thistle Farm uh, Coopcast. I, I used to really enjoy that show. If anybody's never heard it, you can actually still find all their episodes online. And go check them out. Uh, it is definitely one worth listening to. And they, they were just extremely entertaining. <laughs> they really were great podcasts, very well produced. They did a really, really good job. So go check that out. And, uh, Christopher forgot to leave the name of his, uh, uh blog that he started in the, uh, in his audio there, but, uh, he sent me an email later and, and told me what it was. It's thefreedomliving.com. And, uh, 
I actually went over and checked it out already. It's really good. You guys would like checking that out. Uh, it's got a lot of stuff to offer there. And it uh, looks like he hasn't been doing it very long, but uh, it's, a, it's a really nice, well-done website. Good job, Christopher. Uh, uh, so everybody go check that out. And uh, I just love all your reasons for why you got into homesteading and what you're doing there. And, and thank you very much for submitting that. Um, next, we'll be hearing from uh, Tom Dahmers. He is the host of the Small Scale Life podcast, which you really ought to go check out. Uh, he, he has a great episode. Matter of fact, his last episode I just heard what he done with his wife is really, really good on minimalism. I really enjoyed that one. Uh, but, uh, Tom's going to let us, uh, hear why he got into homesteading. Hey, Harold, this is Tom Dahmers from Minneapolis, Minnesota. What a great idea for a podcast. I love it. I got interested in gardening and homesteading during the crash of 2008. My wife was reading Little House on the Prairie to our boys, and with all the chaos that was going on at my job, in our neighborhood, in our community, in our state, in our country, I just started thinking about how our ancestors and my grandparents were just so much more self-reliant than we are today. They just had skills that we don't have. So we got inspired from our neighbor who was into gardening, and we started our own square foot gardens. And we are starting our own urban homestead here in Minneapolis this year. We are documenting that, our, our journey at smallscalelife.com. That's our blog and podcast there. We just did our 80th show with my wife on. So if you want to learn more about us, listen to that podcast. You'll learn a lot. And uh, we're just having a lot of fun. We fully support what you're doing on your blog, your podcast, your forum, in your community. We really support you, Harold. And we hope that you're feeling better. Thank you for this opportunity. Keep doing great things, and we'll see you soon. Take care, Harold. Oh, great stuff from Tom. Thank you for that, Tom. I appreciate it. And uh, seriously, guys, go check out that podcast. It's really good stuff. And again, I'll have his link uh, to his to his uh, website in the uh, show notes. But definitely worth checking out. I really enjoy what Tom's doing over there, and I appreciate him uh, coming on and, and sharing a little bit about uh, what got him started and down this path. Next, we're going to hear from uh, David DeSower. Uh, David is our, uh, I feel like he's our resident um, brainiac slash comedian at the Homestead Front Forge. He's always got some great insights on uh, topics uh, that we're talking about in there. And and David's got jokes. David's David's funny guy. <laughs> he, I don't know if you pick up on that too much in what he shares here today. But uh, yeah, he definitely, um, he's definitely a funny guy. And uh, I think you'll enjoy his reasons for uh, what got him down heading down this path. My name is Dave. I run a blog called Opting Out at optout.killchair.net, and I don't belong. I never have. I'm also the generation that was promised that if we worked hard and made a lot of money for our betters, we'd be afforded precarious work situations, ever-changing careers, and a continual erosion of both employment benefits and governmental social services. And you could flat out forget about doing anything meaningful with your life, unless you had the face for a TED Talk, cracking the hardest nuts would net you a promotion to the head of the widget subunit A design department before the lunchtime meeting to which you weren't invited decided to bury your development in the interest of the shareholders and make your position redundant. I took a few cracks at it. I started studying engineering, then got some security credentials and worked in that field for a bit, finally settled on a degree of biology and a few associated gigs. The story was always the same. I could do the work. I couldn't hack the social situation. I found myself in a dead-end, low-wage job, in a community in which I was decidedly unwelcome, with deteriorating mental health that I couldn't disclose to my employer as it would quickly become town gossip. I quit the day job and started focusing on my side business. Same story repeated. I could do the work, couldn't handle the community. Fortunately, despite my naivete, I had made a few good choices. By the time the situation had reached a critical stage, I would married a wonderful woman and was living in an acre of land in a house we had already gutted and reframed, to be well insulated and designed for a passive solar gain. A lifetime of having neither the resources to hire professionals nor buddies to help out had left me with a pretty decent skill set, mechanical, construction, technology, bushcraft, and so forth. My wife has a skill set to complement mine. She has a green thumb like I've never seen before. I swear plants spring into bloom as she walks by and produce food by her gaze alone. She also has a way with animals, and if we don't have a particular skill, well then one or two of us will learn it quickly. So really, it became a matter of economics. A penny saved is more than a penny earned, you see. If I earn a penny, then I pay income tax on it and sales tax when I spend it. Furthermore, I'm likely earning that penny within an organization designed to extract as much work from me as possible for as few pennies as possible. That penny of earnings represents a nickel of labor, or maybe a dime. I'm spending it within the same sort of organizations, paying for someone's second yacht. By contrast, if I save a penny, then I save myself all the above inefficiencies. 
For each penny I don't need to earn, I'm left with all the time and effort and mental overhead that would have gone into earning that penny. If I'm saving that penny by directly acquiring my goods, then I'm also avoiding the inefficiency on the consumer end of things. Even though it takes a few hours to carve up a roadkill deer, if I consider what it costs to buy meat of a similar quality at the grocery store, I'm making a very decent theoretical wage for my efforts. That's not even touching on the satisfaction that comes from such an endeavor. That's the crux of it, really. I don't need money, I need stuff. I need water and food and shelter and medicine. Some of those things can only be reasonably acquired with money. Part of having my shelter is paying property taxes. The municipal government won't barter for chickens. A lot of areas in life are open to bypassing money entirely, though. Those aforementioned chickens lay eggs and are made of meat. Every tomato we grow in the garden saves us having to buy them. An initial investment in photovoltaic panels and you can be preheating water. Install a wood stove you can heat with deadfall. Although I tend towards manufactured building supplies for many projects, I haven't paid for labor since I hired a contractor to install a foundation for me and they tried to get away with omitting rebar from the middle of the stem wall. If I need to learn a skill well enough to supervise someone, then I may as well do it myself. Doing it yourself also gives you something you simply cannot buy. Autonomy. You can work smart rather than hard, and then work hard to get even more done. You can do things to your specifications and in your own time. You can eschew this plastic veneer of civilization that people put over their lives and focus on things that produce results. And best of all, you can still benefit from the society around you. It is, after all, a wasteful and inefficient society. People discard things because they don't know how to fix them or they've gone out of style. They give away their resources because they're too lazy to convert them into a usable form or because they're too tired after a long day of work. They just want to move on to their chosen hobby or vice in an attempt to distract themselves from the drudgery of their existence. If you live this way, ignoring convention, doing for yourself, scavenging off the carcass of society, well, you may find that the people with the most to share in terms of experience and perspective are those who call themselves homesteaders. Well, thanks for that, Dave. Uh, uh, definitely go check out Dave's uh, website. Uh, he is a... Uh, a very good writer and uh, you'll enjoy reading some of the articles he posts there. So definitely check that out. Thanks for sharing, Dave. Okay. That wraps up everybody who sent a clip in, but next I, well, I went back into the archives and I, uh, I pulled out a couple, uh, like I said earlier that I thought were, uh, memorable, uh, pretty good from, from episodes past. And the first one I came across was, uh, Ariel Gunn in episode 42. Uh, she's, uh, uh, homesteading in the suburbs and, um, uh, her story's a little different why she got into it and her situation. And, uh, I thought it was just a, it was interesting. It was kind of a different perspective from a lot of folks. And I thought you might want to hear this one. So here's Ariel, uh, back on episode 42, sharing with us why she got into homesteading. Ariel is an urban homesteader in Texas who is taking steps towards self-sufficiency right where she is. Um, Ariel, uh, welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. Thank you. It's wonderful to be talking with you. Well, I'm really excited to talk to you. Uh, I'm, I'm just dying to hear how you uh, got started in, uh, down uh, the path of uh, homesteading. And I was just wondering if you could just take a couple minutes and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got started. Okay. Um, so my name is Ariel. I'm... 35 and I live in like a suburban area outside a major city in Texas. And how I got into urban homesteading is kind of a, just a lot of little things leading up to it. Um, different paths all leading up to the main path. Mm -hmm. So, um, first I would say my first step was probably beekeeping. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's just something that I've been wanting to do for Gosh, at least like 10 years. Um, so let me take a step back. I have a, an eight to five desk job and, um, I just kind of started taking stock of things and wondering if this was going to be it. I just sit at a desk, um, every day, all day and go home and, and then I retire and when I'm old and, and that's all. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, I started thinking, you know, well, no one's going to help me make anything out of this life except for except for me I'm kind of I'm my option I'm my own my only hero to this story mm -hmm. so what can we do to make things better so I asked myself well, well what do you want to do something I wanted to do for a very long time um, was keep bees and so I decided all right we're doing it I'm doing it here we go and started jumping in and then as soon as I did, um, pieces of the puzzle started coming together. I met my cousin's um, boyfriend, husband-to-be, at a family gathering, and then turns out he keeps bees. So I asked him to be my mentor, and he agreed and started me out with a couple of nukes, mm -hmm. and I began 
capturing. So um, that felt great to make that happen. And then, um, you know, it kind of gave me confidence to start moving on some other ideas. One thing that I had been wanting to do was was keep chickens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it sounds fun and everything like that, but also I'm a vegetarian. And so I felt ethically conflicted about participating in the egg industry. You know, I exited from the meat industry and um, it, it felt hypocritical to continue to participate in the egg industry. And I said, well, okay, there's really no reason that I couldn't take this into my own hands and there's another way to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, in the spirit of self-sufficiency, um, there's no reason that I couldn't take this on. And so um, I, I looked into, you know, what does my city allow and started researching, started getting on some podcasts and learning how to care for chickens. Mm -hmm. And um, and I got some girls. And so now I have five layers and um, I love them. They're so fun. <laughs> And um, then I've always been into gardening. Um, I always kept herbs and, and flowers and so forth. Uh, my mom and my mom's mom and my aunt raised me to to garden and to, you know, love to grow and nurture. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've continued with that. I, I have a lot of herbs. And um, I actually started a community herb garden this year. And so that's been really rewarding as well, like being able to teach people when they ask me, what's that? And how, I can't believe that was so easy to grow and I can help them learn how. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and then, then I've added vegetables this year a little bit, a couple of raised beds and um, started composting. So I'm just sort of trying to add, add in one thing at a time, sure. get better at it, get more confident. The next one I wanted to pull out of the archives was from uh, Cindy Patterson back on episode 44. Uh, she was homesteading up in Saskatchewan, Canada, and uh, her story is is somewhat familiar uh, to most of us, you know, health reasons and uh, food security and, and things like that. But I thought her story was pretty good, and I wanted to share that one with you as well. So here here's Cindy back on episode 44. Uh, would you just take a couple minutes and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started homesteading? Well, we uh we kind of actually started uh a little slowly at a time. We uh we started out with moving to the farm about 3 years ago uh for there's a husband's family farm. So we moved out here. Um and we had they had, you know, some cattle in the garden of course, but uh our youngest child is our son. He uh couldn't have cow's milk, so we were buying goat's milk and it's very hard to find and, you know, it expensive and my husband said to me why on earth are we going to all this trouble to have to drive an hour and a half and try and find this goat's milk and not be able to find it when we have a farm why don't we just buy a goat <laughs> so <laughs> I was like well I don't know why don't we just buy a goat <laughs> so we uh yeah we bought our first couple goats and started milking and you know we thought well hey this is pretty handy and and then uh after that we you know started doing a little more research on other animals and mm -hmm. things and thought you know, we want to know what's in the food we're feeding our kids and and where it comes from and know that it's something healthy. And mm -hmm. we had uh, we had decided that we were going to, you know, try and produce as much as we could. And then but there was three shopping trips in a row that we went and uh, we got home and had all our groceries put away. And a couple of days later, found out that one of the things that we had bought was recalled due to, you know, contamination or whatever. Oh, wow. It was three times in a row. So after that, we we're like, you know what? <laughs> Instead of shopping and spending all this money and then, you know, having to find out that it's been recalled because it's contaminated or there's something in it, let's just produce our own food. Mm -hmm. So kind of went from there. Yeah, so, it's, a, it's a common story. Everybody wants to know what they're <laughs> eating for some reason. I don't understand it. <laughs> Well, you've heard from some great folks today uh, about the reasons they got into homesteading. So what I wanted to do was close today with my story uh, of why I got into homesteading. This was on uh, Jason Carrier's podcast, Live Free and Grow. And uh, he asked me, uh, you know, kind of where, uh, why I got started in homesteading and the things I was doing. So we shared this with him. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this. And then I'll come back at the end with some closing words. So here, uh, I obviously listen to your podcast. I'm a, I'm a fan. I like what you're doing. Why don't you go ahead and tell the, our listeners about yourself? Well, uh, yeah, I host the Modern Homesteading Podcast and have a website, smalltownhomestead.com, and been doing that for, uh, oh, I think about three years now. And uh, you're just trying to 
grow a little bit of food on a small city lot and, uh, you know, just be as self-sufficient as we can. That's one of the things I'm most impressed about when I hear, you know, you actually talk about the size of your land because, you know, I, I'm not fully self-sufficient and we live on 30 acres now. Mm-hmm. And that's, anyway, every year I get a little bit better. I, you know, I built a greenhouse this year. I, for me, the big thing was learning to garden. I did not grow up gardening. And about 20 years ago, when we got transferred from Hawaii to Quantico and we moved out to the suburbs, I, I decided I was going to be the, I'm going to grow a garden and I killed everything. <laughs> and, and I walked away from it for probably about 18 years. So <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a learning process for sure. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, it's funny. It's, I think a lot of people give up after the first time they try. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you, we, we're far from being fully self-sufficient by any means here on a, you know, we're on about a tenth of an acre and, you know, and, and grow a lot of things and raise a few, uh, small, uh, livestock. You know, I felt like we do pretty good, but, you know, it all kind of came around. I felt like I had to do it. You know, it just kind of came to that point in my life where, <laughs> you know, for health reasons, I, I had to make the plunge and, and just do what I could right where I was. You mentioned that. So how, uh, in, yeah, I know from listening to your podcast, you came down with cancer. Uh, do you mind talking about that? No, no, it's uh, it's why I'm here. Uh, you know, I uh, about five years ago, I was uh, over the road truck driver for many years. I've been driving a truck for I think 23 years, something like that. And I had my own business for years, and I just stayed gone a lot. I'd come home, you know, weekends occasionally, and and uh, just got to where I was living out there on the road, eating out a lot, you know, eating a lot of that junky, you know, truck stop, whatever, a lot of fast food, just, you know, never really ate healthy. And, uh, for years doing that, wasn't never a really grossly overweight guy, but it just didn't matter. You know, I just, that, uh, uh, that poison that for lack of a better word, you know, that, that we're, that's the only option out there for the most part. Um, I was just consuming it, you know, two, three times a day, and uh, for years of that, and I come down with stage three colon cancer. And at that time, I'd actually taken a, uh, a home every night truck driving job. I, you know, I'd got rid of my business and sold all my trucks and, um, you know, just uh, decided I wanted to be home more often. Kids were, you know, at this point, my kids were, my youngest was graduating from high school at that point. I have three daughters and uh, um, decided I was going to work and stay home. Well, I wasn't doing that very long, maybe a year and a half. And just got started feeling real bad and found out I had uh, colon cancer and, uh, you know, it, it went, started going through everything. I had to go through a surgery and then I started chemo and I did my first chemo treatment on my 40th birthday. And, um, yeah, that was a great way to spend a birthday. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just felt like something had to change. I knew, I just knew nobody in my family had had cancer. I just knew that the way I had been living, my lifestyle was the reason I had it. The, the, the food I was eating, you know, sitting in a truck all day, not really getting the exercise I needed. It was the reason I had cancer. And, um, you know, I felt like, well, what can I do? You know, I, because I was off of work for so long, you know, it's like you, you dwindle away your savings. You, you know, you can't go buy a, a farm somewhere. You're living in town. Um, you know, I, I grew up on a homestead. I, I, we had cows and chickens and pigs and goats and, you know, we had everything. And, um, I always wanted to have that lifestyle back. You know, we had a big garden. We always ate like that. And, you know, I was always looking to get back into that one day. And, uh, but, you know, you marry a city girl and you start your own business and <laughs> you get a little sidetracked, right? And, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, but I thought, well, you know, what can I do here? And I remember I, I, I was sitting here. I'd done a couple chemo treatments. I wasn't really doing much. I was sitting on my couch just watching YouTube videos because, you know, what else are you going to do? You don't feel like doing anything else, right? And I ran across a video called Homegrown Revolution by the Dervais family. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. I have they're, not. I'm they're urban up. homesteaders in Pasadena, California. And Jules Dervais is the dad of the family, and he started this. He's since passed away. I think last year he passed away. Um, but the, the family continues to live that way. And they're urban homesteaders, and they grow an amazing amount of food. Yeah, look up that video, uh, Homestead, Homegrown Revolution, on YouTube and watch that. And that one just made me realize the possibilities of growing a lot of food on a small city lot and it just blew me away. And then I started just investigating that and seeing other people that were doing it, you know, growing a lot of food, raising urban livestock, things like that. And it really got my wheels turning. And I thought, well, what could I do here? I mean, my, my lot was nothing but grass. I mean, I had no trees, no plants, no nothing, just grass lot, just nothing but lawn. And, um, I started immediately. I went out there and I built two raised beds and I threw some soil in them and started growing stuff. And I first just started off with a little salad garden, you know, just some lettuce and, you know, a couple tomato plants and 
peppers, things like that. And, uh, and it just grew to where, you know, most of my yard is a garden now. And then now we also raise rabbits and quail and have done chickens, not doing that right now. Um, yeah, large garden and livestock. That's what we're doing here. And I did this for, for health reasons. I did it also because it was a lifestyle I'd always wanted. You know, I do it for self-sufficiency. I, uh, you know, I, I do it because I think we're forgetting a lot of skills from the past. And I like to, you know, pass those things down to my children and my grandchildren. You know, I think it's, I'm, I'm, you know, I love the environment. I'm a hunter. I'm a fisher. Uh, you know, I love to take care of the environment. I think this is a better way because we're not using pesticides. We're growing organically, you know, and these things, uh, you know, I just, I think it's a better way to grow your food, to have your food. So I do it for the environment. I also do it for preparedness. Being off of work for so long, uh, it was just a couple months, but it was enough to dwindle down my, you know, any savings we had and brought us down to a paycheck to paycheck, uh, type of living. And, you know, I started thinking, you know, we want to put food up. We want to, uh, you know, save money, uh, do a better job of saving money. So it really helps us with our preparedness as well. And, you know, and I'm sure, uh, maybe you'd want to even talk about the, the freedom that growing your own food allows. Um, you know, it, it, there's a, there's a sense of food freedom where I don't have to eat the food you tell me I have to eat. I can grow my own food. And, uh, I like that kind of freedom, you know, and, um, cause there's not a lot of options out there. You know, you go to the grocery store or you go, you know, go to a restaurant or whatever, you're going to eat what they give you. And it's not the best stuff you can buy organic. And even there, you know, there's, it's questionable whether that's really good or not, what they call organic. But even then, it's way more expensive. So you have some freedom on what you're going to pay for food. You have some freedom on what you're putting in your body. So I do it for that reason as well. Plus, we give a lot of food away, and, you know, it, it encourages others to to kind of go down this path as well. So we also do it for community and to be a better neighbor and, you know, things like that, and to inspire change. We, we really – it's the reason I, I do a podcast, and it's the reason that I um, have a website, and, and, you know, you're part of our Facebook group that, that we have. And, uh, you know, and, and I think it's a, it's something that a lot of people are waking up to. And I think it's, you know, I'm all about wanting to see change, you know, and pe- people to eat better and, and have a better way of life. So I couldn't agree more. I think there's something fundamentally wrong with our food supply. Well, there you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode, uh, and hearing all the reasons why some of us are homesteading. And I think, uh, I find it encouraging to listen to other people's stories of why they're doing it. And it really just wants to, it motivates me and, and helps me stay at, stay the course and, uh, uh, push forward. And, uh, I know that, um, sometimes it, life can distract us and, and uh, the shiny object syndrome where we kind of look the other way and we start uh, taking our eyes off the real reasons we begin doing this. Um, and uh, when we hear things like this, it kind of reminds us of how important it is to, to stay that course. So I hope it's helped you as well. I, I find it encouraging and helpful. And uh, if you enjoy episodes like this and you enjoy the Modern Homesteading Podcast, would you consider joining our Homestead Forum membership community? Uh, go to smalltownhomestead.com. And uh, there in the menu, you can see uh, a tab for joining the membership. It's uh, $29 a year or $2.99 a month. And uh, it uh, it really does do a lot to keep this podcast going. And more than that, you get extra stuff. Uh, every week there's a podcast going up in there. There's uh, live chat discussions. Uh, there's uh, some videos you can watch in there. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on in there. Plus, you get discounts from other vendors. So it's really worth being a part of, and it really helps keep this thing going. And it's pretty inexpensive. You know, it's just your way of doing a little bit to kind of help this podcast out if you enjoy it and you want to see it continue on for a long, long time and even get better. Uh, I hope we're getting better at this. You know, as I was going back in the archives and trying to find some clips, I realized that uh, the podcast uh, audio quality has gotten much better <laughs> over the years. Uh, in the early days, the audio quality really wasn't that great. So, um, you know, I think it's getting better. And I think uh, as time goes on, it'll even it'll get better and better. So uh, thank you for uh, being part of that. If you already are a part of that, thank you for any other ways you support the podcast. Those of you who sent in, an audio clip today. I really appreciate that. Uh, you really came through for me. Uh, you could tell that I, as you can tell, I'm not real. I wouldn't, didn't really want to talk for 45 minutes straight for a podcast episode. 
And uh, even doing these little clips that I've been doing, I've had to edit out several coughs <laughs> while I've been doing it. So I thank you guys uh, for uh, for sending those in. And I uh, thank you for being a part of the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group. If you want to be a part of that, uh, just uh, search in Facebook for Homestead Front Porch, uh, request to join, answer a couple questions, and we'll get you right in there. It's a great great community of folks uh i look forward to coming back next week with the uh, the episode on caternix quail i think that's going to be a really good one i'm excited about that one and uh, until then a happy homesteading and god bless thanks for listening to see the show notes for this podcast or listen to other podcast episodes go to smalltownhomestead.com there you can also read our blog, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and take advantage of the many resources we make available to help you along in your homesteading journey. Please share this podcast and help us to carry out our mission of helping others to homestead today for a better tomorrow. Mm-hmm.